to the final talk of the day. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Carlo Rivelli, who's a theoretical physicist and is well known for contributing to loop quantum gravity and for introducing the relational interpretation of quantum mechanics, which I believe uh, Carlo Rivelli will be presenting on today. And with that, thank you so much for coming and I give the floor to you, Carlo. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, this is a fantastic audience. Uh, so it's a it's it's a great privilege to uh, to give this talk. Is the audience I would uh, mostly have loved for the, uh, for this talk. Uh, I feel a little bit uh, strange in this community because the majority of of, of you people listening. Uh, are uh, sort of uh, have a different perspective from quantum theory uh, than the one I'm presenting here. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, um, I do consider uh, myself as a pupil of Everett in this uh, quite a lot. Uh, and I see the relational interpretation of one development out of Everett paper. Everett paper had an enormous influence on me when I, when I read it. It was, a, it was a bit shocking for me reading it. It, it, it rearranged my, my thinking long, long ago. Um, so the, 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 the super simple way of putting this is that uh, if out of, rev of, 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 of whatever it did, uh, uh, you sort of focus on the relevance of the universal wave function, you should naturally go in the direction of uh, many world. Uh, if instead you focus on uh, the relative states and uh, sort of relative values attribution, you go more in the, the direction of relational quantum mechanics. This is not, this is not as a genesis of, of ever, this is not what Ever it means what we, what what you can do with this uh, um, with this idea. So just just to uh, frame it, and let me uh, zoom directly on uh, uh, on relational quantum mechanics and try to say uh, 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 what it is. And I think that the best way, especially for this audience, to introduce it is to um, observe that there are two uh, sort of basic way of thinking about quantum uh, mechanics and its mathematics, and two way of teaching it. And uh, uh, quite remarkably, how you learn it first, uh, sort of design your, 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 your view of it. So if I ask a person, a student, um, what's the basis of quantum mechanics? Let's just take the simplest case uh, of, a, of, a, uh, of a non-relativistic particle. One possible answer is, well, you have a wave function and you have the Schrodinger equation, and then somehow out of the Schrodinger equation, you compute probability of things to happen roughly with this formula, for instance, for the, uh, for the position, and that's the basic of story. And then of course, blah, 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 difficulty, problems, interpretation, or whatever. But there's another way of, uh, in fact, teaching quantum mechanics and presenting quantum mechanics, uh, which does not mention uh, the Schrodinger equation, does not mention a wave function, does not mention probability in that sense, uh, which is to say that uh, quantum mechanics is about uh, variables that describe systems, more or less the same as in, uh, uh, classical theory. Uh, and uh, these take values uh, and the equations that these variables satisfy are the same as in a sort of the, the classical limit of the theory in the, in, in, in the classical theory, plus one, plus one equation, which is xp minus px equal i h bar. Again, I'm thinking of single degree of freedom. And uh, these uh, uh, var variables uh, take value, a at take value time t, b time value uh, time t prime, and we can compute the probabilities again, of a, a, a certain uh, realizational value A, uh, given that a certain realizational value uh, B um, uh, happened, uh, if, if A is, is a time T uh, after uh, T prime here, T prime equals zero, if I want to compare with that. And this is the formula. Um, the point being simply that the equations are the same as the classical theory, the variable is the same as the, quantum, the classical theory, but this extra equation um, is there, which means that, uh, the variables from non-commutative algebra, uh, which implies that there's a spectrum, you can compute these quantities here and, and, and so on. Now, if you have been schooled in wave mechanics in Schrodinger, uh, this sounds strange, but I want to remember, remind everybody that this actually is how quantum mechanics was invented in 1925 before uh, 1926 uh, Schrodinger paper. And if you look at the literature, quite remarkable, this is a historical remark. Uh, it's not 
particularly important history, but I think in this case, it, uh, it helps clarify. If you look at quantum mechanics in 25, so before the wave function, before the notion of quantum state, more generally, not just the wave function, uh, quantum state, um, so more, more general, uh, quantum mechanics was already there. In fact, the sequence of paper written by Heisenberg, Born, Jordan, Dirac, uh, is sufficient for compute everything in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. It's a full theory without any mention of a quantum state, just in terms of uh, transition amplitudes between uh, um, uh, values, variables that can uh, have value. And uh, uh, so this is the two founding paper. The, 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 the next one, the third one, perhaps the most important uh, of all. This is a, the 25 paper, the magic Heisenberg paper, where he just uh, introduced essentially non commutative variables. And this, by the way, if, if you like history, this is the actual copy that Flower gave to Dirac, saying, what do you think about that, from which Dirac developed the theory independently. And this is the uh, Bohr-Jordan paper. Uh, it has everything all right. It has the equation, it has the matrices, it has the notion of probability. Born got the Nobel Prize for probability, and everybody thinks about his later paper after Schrodinger, but he had clear that the formula was about probability, transition amplitudes, uh, already in 25, much before any mention of, of, of the uh, of Schrodinger. So that was the theory in 25. These are the people. Um, Dirac got a uh, Heisenberg paper and essentially wrote the same theory as, as, as the other three in Gottingen independently in the, the spectacular papers by, 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 by Dirac, the, the, the fundamental equations of quantum mechanics. And the theory, as I said, the math is the same equation plus a mechanical plus one, only that. So out of this extra equation, you get you know quantum computers, atomic bombs, laser, whatever. whatever. Uh, the physics is that since the variables are in a non-commutative algebra, they have a spectrum, which is naturally defined for non-commutative algebra. So generically, uh, the values that it can take is only in the spectrum. Uh, by, by assumption, and uh, which is a, a posture. So discreteness is at the core of the story because uh, spectrum can be discrete. And out of the algebra, you can compute this probability, um, probability uh, amplitudes. If you want, you can represent the algebra as operator on a Hilbert space. You can flip the Heisenberg uh, uh, sort of picture, uh, the evolution of the, of the variables into an evolution of the state and get the Schrodinger equation. So of course, we know how to translate from one um, to the other. Um, but that's how quantum mechanics was born. And you can do all the calculations with that, without fitting. Um What are these values, variables that take values? When do they take value? Okay, of course, in, in, in textbook quantum mechanics, there's this funny answer when there is a measurement, uh, which is incomprehensible, and which has give, given rise to the entire debate of the interpretation of uh, quantum mechanics. Now, relational quantum mechanics, all this was history. Relational quantum mechanics is the idea, let's take seriously this formulation of quantum mechanics. So I know that I am like, you know, a, a Christian uh, preaching in a, uh, in a mosque or, 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 or an Islamic uh, uh, a teacher preaching in a church, uh, but uh, I, I, I ask you to, um, to follow me on, 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 on a different uh, mind frame for a moment, forget the state, forget the wave function, forget all that, and think about variables that take value at certain discrete times, okay? When, so think about systems, systems that have variables, and these uh, var variables take value when in the discrete interactions between systems. So here is the relation interpretation. Here's the story. First of all, uh, we, systems. We, we, we think of the world as uh, can be decomposed in systems, in alternative ways, like we do in classical mechanics. The system is the phase space and is characterized by a uh, set of uh, variables. So the second ingredient is variables. Each system can be characterized by a set of variables. It's in classical mechanics. In quantum mechanics, they, they are an algebra, but also in classical mechanics, they are an algebra. But in quantum mechanics, the mathematics of this algebra is assumed to be non-commutative, right? And here's the difference. Here's quantum theory. These variables, uh, when they take value, the, the, the variables do not represent how the system is, but they represent how the system does, what the system does to another system when there's an interaction. So outside this context, uh, there is no, uh, the, the values are not determined. So the, 
sorry, I forgot to close my telephone. Um, so this is the key point. Um, values take value only at interaction. Okay, this is discrete. This is the key idea of Max Born and Heisenberg. The world is a it, it's a sequence of discrete events. Okay, of, you can prob can compute probabilities of the the these events, including the probability of when they happen. And that's a key point. Uh, the value that they take is relative to interacting systems. So if a system S interacts with system O, um, a, 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 the, 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 the variable one system take a value with respect to other one. And we'll see in a moment technically what, what this means. And the occurrence that the values has a system is called a quantum event, right? The, 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 the photon arrives here. Uh, the, 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 the photon is emitted from an atom or, or, or whatever quantum events you can imagine. All right, so uh, uh, the, the values can only take uh, 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 value, the variables can only take value in, in, in uh, uh, the spectrum of the uh, variables, which is determined by the algebra. Once you have algebra, you can define the spectrum. Uh, generically, it can be discrete. Uh, it's also a continuous case, but it can also be seen as a limit of a discrete case. And uh, uh, from the algebraic cycle, you can compute probabilities for uh, 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 things to happen, essentially, for quantum events to happen. So for values taking, uh, for variables taking a value given some other uh, variable having taken other values. All right, this is generic. This is uh, how physics work. To connect, to our usual uh, picture of the world, of course, uh, within this world, which is well defined by itself, uh, there is a, uh, uh, a classical world that emerge in the, when there is the coherence. So the coherence plays a key role to not to uh, give the fundamental interpretation of the theory, but to connect that to uh, the classical world with the stability of facts, with the fact that you know you can take notes and the things don't change, and you can show this is a you can show technically that when there is the coherence, uh, you can disregard the fact um, that uh, values are relative. So you can uh, delabel uh, the, the facts uh, effectively without losing anything, and this allows you to sort of reinterpret everything as. Uh, uh, values of having a, 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 a fixed value. Okay, so this is a relation interpretation. A few comments. Wait, what about the wave function or the quantum state? Um, uh, they have no sort of ontological weight here at all. They interpret epistemically. Namely, if two systems interact, uh, there are some values of one, uh, one system relative to the other one, and this can be coded in the wave function, which is also a calculus that allows you to compute the probability uh, of a further outcome of interactions. Um, I'll come back to that, but uh, the classical limit of the wave function is the Hamilton-Jacobi function, which essentially does the same role in classical mechanics. Uh, namely, it's, it's, it's a device for computing where the particle is going to go. It's not a, an entity by itself. Nobody would think that the Hamilton Jacobi function for classical particle has to be interpreted ontologically. So, this uh, definitely separates uh, relational quantum mechanics from many worlds. Uh, there are many similarities between relational quantum mechanics and many worlds. Deep. I mean, you, you, you think that in some sense evolution is always unitary, but not in the sense that. Uh, uh, the state is the, the, the quantum state is a thing which is out there, out of which you have derived things. Here, the logic is completely reserved, reversed. Um, in, in, in many worlds, you have this wave function, and then you have a long story to tell, which many of you are deeply immersed in, uh, in clarifying how to tell the story. Um, here is you have a long story to tell to connect to the to the numbers <laughs> that we we associate to to the scheme of the world in the laboratory, and to the probabilities. Here is the other way around with the numbers uh, uh, first. That's what reality is all about. Uh, the electron is here, the electron is there, and uh, the quantum state is just a, I interpret as a, as a tool for for doing that. There's no role for observers, no role of agents, agents, no role of subject of knowledge or, or anything like that, which is foundational in, Q, in Qubis, uh, for instance. Um, the, in a sense, there's no measurement, unless you want to call any interaction a measurement, it's really a stretch. Uh, 
Of course, there is specific situations in which there is measurement because it's the coherence, you can analyze that, and that's it's a, the standard analysis of measurement with all the, the coherence is a fact, it's not, a, it's not an opinion. Uh, and, and it allows us to understand from, from this logic, how you go from these relational variables to the so, so much fixed world of, of, of classical theory. Um, and discreteness, I'll, I'll jump at it. Discreteness is, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, fundamental. Uh, there, there, are, uh, there, there is nothing that happens. There's no point in, in, in talking about what happens because nothing happens between two different interactions, which is Heisenberg original intuition, right? Heisenberg comes back from Heldoland, the island, where he writes his paper and, and, and writes to Pauli, uh, the electron is not going to have an orbit anymore. I mean, forget about that. Now, uh, Wojciech Zurek had this uh, uh, slide at the beginning of this conference in which he said, oh, no, one of the many ways of thinking about the measurement problem is, how, is, is to, to think about the, the, the apparent contradiction between the, the postulate number four and number five uh, in, in, in one of the standard presentation of quantum mechanics uh, in terms of postulates, the collapse postulates and the, and the probability uh, uh, um, uh, ev evolution, or if you want, between number two and number four, between the unitary evolution and the, the uh, collapse uh, postulate, depending how you uh, present the things. Now, so the tension, and that's somehow the, another way of viewing the, the, the core of the idea here. The tension between unitary evolution and wave function collapse, uh, it's resolved by relativizing values. Namely, um, uh, if you want, uh, if you think about Wigner friend, when, when the friend make a measurement, uh, there is a collapse of the function with respect to friends because there's a values which are realized rely with respect to friends, right? So it, friends in his calculation collapse the wave function. But this has no direct bearing with what Wigner is going to measure at a later time, namely as the, uh, uh, the, the values that friend plus systems are going to realize interacting with uh, Wigner uh, later on. So the evolution of the probability distribution, what can happen is well described by uh, unitary evolution as long as the system is isolated with respect to another system. But this does not have information about what happens at the subsystem interacting um, one, with the, uh, one with the other. Now, this is a sketchy presentation of uh, relational quantum mechanics, uh, the way I understand it. Uh, uh, I've, I've been clarifying my mind. A lot of people's worked uh, on that. There have been all people writing from different perspectives. So my way of thinking has slightly evolved. Let me fra frame it with respect to other <clears throat> perspective. Actually, let me start from this. Um, do I think that many worlds or cubism or hidden variables, you know, W bone, are incoherent? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, strongly. In fact, you know, I spent enormous amount of time trying to convince myself that other interpretations are incoherent, and I, they're not. They're all coherent. I mean, they, they have difficulties, open questions, like all everything, but it's they, they're all coherent. The point I think is that uh, it's a fact that quantum mechanics allows different ways of thinking about the world. Um, and, and I like to to quote Feynman that says one of the amazing characteristic for nature is that the variety of interpretation schemes that it admits. And Feynman has a great um, way of putting that, namely a, a good physicist uh, keep all this, of this in mind, uh, not because they're equal, uh, because he doesn't know which one is going to be helpful in the future, the one who's going to be productive in the future. I think this is a beautiful way of framing the problem. There are different ways of thinking about quantum mechanics. Uh, they are coherent. I mean, you can think that there is a, you know, the Bully Boma particle in a, in a wave. Why not? Uh, you can think that there are copies of yourself seeing something else, like in, uh, in, in many world. Uh, why not? Nature admits this description. The question is, which one is going to be useful? Um, this is my, this is far from exhaustive. It's just, uh, you know, some of the uh, interpretation which are most mm, discussed. Uh, uh, this is my way of thinking about relational quantum mechanics. There are some, uh, like many worlds of hidden variables, which uh, give a strong ontological uh, 
weight to the uh, to the wave function, whether alone, and then you have to, to write the story to connect it to you know probabilities, actual values, and so on and so forth, or um, adding the actual uh, uh, values to, to to the story. And uh, these are in, in one way realist, in some sense more realist interpretation of quantum mechanics. And there are others that go in the direction of instrumentalism. Um, like cubism, in which you just focus on the idea there is an agent, and what you're talking about is how things act on an agent. And in a sense, standard Copenhagen is similar. You have, you're measuring apparatus, and you, you, you describe what happened when the system act on the measuring apparatus. And initial quantum mechanics tries to navigate between the two. Namely, um, there are things that happen when systems interact. It's realist in that sense, strongly realist, but not about the wave function, about this uh, quantum events, which are real out there in the world, nothing to do a priori with the macroscopic or with agents, um, but are relational. Namely, what happened with respect to the cat is not the same that what happened. It doesn't directly affect what happened uh, with respect to another observer. Um, I'll, I'll skip that. Each one, in my view, each one of these uh, uh, perspective and others uh, have a strong advantage, which is what captures the people like it, and in a a, 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 a conceptual cost, which is what keeps away the people who dislike them. And that's why we are so uh, we are so divided in, in, in thinking quantum mechanics in uh, in different ways. And uh, what I like about relational quantum mechanics myself is that it keeps away from this radical instrumentalism, which I don't think is useful in science because in science we have to think about the world, not about my knowledge about the world, as Paul would say. So excessive bore, and it also keeps away from the, the excessive Einstein, the, 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 the realism at the price of adding to the world. For me, the world is the, the penis here, the penis there, um, adding you know, all the rest of the immense wave function or, or, or the hidden variables. These are not arguments that would convince, it's, you know, it's like a, you know, a Catholic convincing a Muslim and vice versa. Uh, but are the, what I found attractive in this perspective about, uh, um, uh, about uh, relational quantum mechanics is avoid radical instrumentalism, but also it avoids adding to reality for fear of instrumentalism um, uh, in ontology beyond, over and above of what is the, the world, which is described by variable having values. Now, how am I doing this time? I'm doing. I'm doing well. So um, I, I want to leave time for discussion because I'm, I, I know what I'm saying. It's, uh, it's controversial, especially in this environment. And I, I, I look forward for it. But I want to add a few, a few comments. One is this. Um, the, the, the phrase above is Bohr. Uh, so to try to synthesize what is quantum mechanics for him. And he says, in, in classical physics, interactions between objects and measuring apparatus can be overlooked. In quantum physics, this inter interaction is inseparable part of the phenomenon. And therefore, the ambiguous description of quantum phenomena is required in principle to include a description of the relevant aspect of the experimental arrangement. That's sort of contextuality, according to Bohr. And that's I find it does capture something very crucial in quantum mechanics, but it's phrased in a way which is nonsense because, of course, it's phrased in sense of in the term of in the sense in terms of apparata, apparatus, and experimental arrangement. Uh, we want to talk about what happened on Andromeda, where there are no experimental apparatus and no experimental arrangement. So, can we take this same idea and free it from its anthropocentric aspect? Right? And yes, it's not hard. You just replace apparatus with whatever other physical system um, the system in question is interacting with and replace experimental arrangement with whatever um, uh, uh, interaction the system we're interested in is, is, uh, it, it, it's undergoing. And so then you, you rewrite the Bohr in the sense, uh, in the following sense, uh, in classical physics, the proper objects are determined irrespectively from the interactions between this and the other, uh, and the other. So, uh, objects have properties by themselves. Quantum physics is, dis is discovery that the interaction are inseparable aspect of the properties. Right. So, properties are not in the thing; are across the thing what is interacting with. 
And therefore, the ambiguous description of the, um, any object requires the inclusion of all the other objects involved in the interaction. And this gets rid of the observer and gets rid of observations. You, you bring it down to um, uh, interaction. And technically, so you say, what is the technical side of all this? It's super simple. You, again, uh, think of quantum mechanics a la Dirac or a la uh, Max Born. Uh, or Heisenberg, right? It's about transition amplitudes. That's what you do in a laboratory. Um, you observe B and you have the probability of A, given B. And now the technical aspect of ratio quantum mechanics is, yes, this is correct, but you have to remember that these are labeled by the system involved into the interaction. So this is a correct uh, 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 probability assignment. Given B being related with respect to S, there's a probability uh, uh, of A happening realizing for, for, for a value realizing respect to S, even by the standard form of quantum mechanics. But this has no meaning. And that's the point. I mean, just take away the meaning to these probability amplitudes, okay? Uh, the poison being out with respect to the cat should not be used. It doesn't determine the probability of. Uh, the external observer uh, to see something about the system uh, 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 cat poison. Why? Because it would kill interference, right? That's the point. I mean, quantum interference is there. I think the quant uh, I think the majority of people here would agree that quantum interference is always there. We might not see it, it be hidden by the clearance, but it's always there. Okay. So um, the cat. With respect to the cat, the cat is, uh, is dead or alive, but with respect to the external observer, is not. If you want, uh, this is the picture. Uh, the, the, the value of the, of the quantum system is relied with respect to the cat, but the external observer can still see interference between the two branches. There's no contradiction of that. Why should there should be contradiction? There's a contradiction also only if you think that uh, the, if this value has been realized with respect to the cat, therefore necessarily it has to be realized with respect to the observer. But who said so? Okay. Um, okay, I'm not going to the uh, consistency uh, story because I want to make some um, uh, general remarks again. Uh, relation, uh, what's confusing in quantum mechanics when you study it in, in textbook uh, is that there is observer, uh, so it seems to be that it's about a subject. And this is, for instance, the, the, the direction that Cube is mistaken, right? It's all about the, the knowledge of an agent. Um, and I think that the confusion is between relational and subjective. There's nothing subjective in physical quantities being relative, right? When I say that uh, um, an object has a velocity relative to another object, uh, I say that the object B is the observer with respect to the object A, and, and the velocity is defined with respect to the observer B. This has nothing to do with subjectivity. The moon has a velocity with respect to the earth and has a velocity with respect to the sun, not because the sun is a subject, because the sun is just a system, a physical system. So racial quantum mechanics says, well, take that, make that generic and much more, much more wide. So um, uh, uh, all quantities are relative in this sense, uh, in the sense in which velocity is, namely, um, uh, all physical quantities are always realized with respect to another system, and they describe what happened in interaction um, between uh, uh, those systems. Uh, let me skip this, and uh, uh, this is more to the point, uh, sort of in, in polemic, if you want, with uh, what the majority of people um, in this audience uh, uh, think, namely, that uh, the quantum state or the wave function should be taken uh, um, objectively. I mean, in, uh, in, in full respect, this is my polemic. First of all, as I said, uh, uh, if you have a new theory and, and there is a mathematical quantity and you want to understand what it means, uh, just go to the limit in which where you understand it. And uh, the wave function, you know the limit. It's classical theory, and you know what it is. It is the, the, the Hamilton function. And as I said, uh, nobody in, in their mind would, uh, would give an ontological interpretation to the Hamilton function. The particle is somewhere in classical mechanics, and the Hamilton function is the way for computing where it goes, which you, of course, you change every time you see where it is, and, and, and you, 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 you update your Hamilton function. 
Quantum mechanics is the same, except that uh, with Heisenberg and, and, and with Schrodinger also later on, as we'll see in a moment, you give up the idea that the particle is always somewhere. Now, one of the strongest arguments for taking the wave function ontologically is that is Schrodinger original uh, argument, uh, which is give a picture of reality so compelling, so beautiful, so clear, like in the in the uh, uh, atomic orbitals. These are the orbitals, you just picture the wave function and you say, yeah, that's what is there. But careful, because we use pictures, very clear, very compelling, very useful at some level, but misleading if they are taken too seriously. Caloric is one example. This is a picture of the caloric. Who would doubt that there is a thing which is being taken uh, by a photo there? But it's not a thing, it's just a, something else, of course, the caloric, it's, it's you know, it's molecules moving, um, uh, moving fast. And I, the, the, the strongest, the, the, the inventor of the, of, of the quantum state, if you want, and uh, the stronger defender of the continuity um, has been Schrodinger himself. And uh, I, again, this is not an authority argument, but I think it's nevertheless interesting to, uh, observe that Schrodinger himself changed his mind uh, uh, quite strongly. And um, he wrote, this is his text late in the 50s, uh, the inventors of wave mechanics, which is him, Wells, indulge for some time in the fond hope that they have paved the way for a return to a classical continuous description. It, the, the, the emphasis here is continuous, continuity. But again, the hope was deceptive. Nature herself seemed to reject continuous descri description because the gaps eliminated from the, uh, from the wave picture have withdrawn to the connection uh, between the wave picture and observable facts. And then he, he, he himself is very strong. It's better to regard a particle not as a permanent entity, but an instantaneous event, more precisely a sequence of this instantaneous event. Now, of course, you may answer to that, that uh, the, 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 the many world interpretation, in fact, is a, it, it, it's a co which I believe is clear, and is a way to say, no, 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 Schrodinger, you were too fast. Uh, you don't give up your hope for continuity. There is an underlying continuity, which is a universal wave function. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and that's correct in a sense. Uh, paying a, su a sufficient price, it's possible to, uh, 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 to do that. I think Schrodinger uh, was not ready to pay this, um, uh, this great price. Let me skip that. But let me um, insist on discreteness because this is, a, I'm, I'm surprised when I hear many of you guys talk about quantum mechanics, because where is discreteness? Quantum mechanics is all about discreteness, right? It started with discreteness, the finite size packets of energy. The, the, the Bohr um, uh, um, orbits are discrete, the matrix are discreteness, the eigenvalues are discreteness. Quantiful theories are about particles discrete, which are quanta of, of, of a field. And discreteness is deep in the core of quantum mechanics. In fact, if you have a, a phase space, this is one dimensional phase space. And you ask how many independent possible states are in a finite region of the phase space, the answer is finite, right? So uh, discreteness is core. In a sense, continuity, it's, you only get continuity by stretching infinite region of phase space. Um, the number of alternatives that can be distinguished in, in, in any measurement, uh, it's the volume Per, per degrees of freedom is a volume of phase space divided by h, right? Uh, with the number of alternatives here in the, in the sense of Shannon. So there is a direct relation between uh, uh, Shannon information, the number of, of alternatives, and the area of uh, um, uh, uh, the, the volume, actually, of uh, uh, phase space, uh, where h is a conversion factor uh, between the two. And Relation quantum mechanics can be entirely formulated in terms of information using essentially this logic and relying on, uh, on, uh, on discreteness uh, using the notion of mutual uh, information. And uh, Zurek uh, uh, was very close to, to some of these ideas in, in, in his talk at this, uh, at this conference. Uh, he also used the notion of um, uh, relative information, Shannon notion of relative information which is uh, um, when two systems have a number of state, a possible number of state, which is less than the product of the two. So there's a correlation between the two. And that's what happened, of course, when two systems interact and in some sense, they know about one another, right? You can measure 
of the information they have in the sense that, you know, if you know something about one, automatically you know something um, about the other. And using this notion of information, that was the beginning of relational quantum mechanics. You can derive quantum mechanics from two main postulates. That's the core of the, of, of the informational view of relational quantum mechanics. And these postulates are the basis of a number of reconstruction theorems that have been proven by a number of people. I mean, my original paper, it was a, it was a, a, a naive uh, uh, and very naive attempt to do reconstruction by somehow cheating and adding, adding, uh, um, uh, adding uh, inputs where I needed them. Relevant, I can't write in English. Um, here are the two, here are the two postulates. First of all, as I said, the amount of information available um, about a finite system, meaning uh, something that classically is a finite, uh, a finite volume phase space is finite, okay? Unlike classical theory, classical theory is infinite, right? Because you can zoom arbitrary, uh, arbitrary as you want in, 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 uh, in, um, uh, in phase space. But it's always possible to gather new relevant information for any system. Now here, the subtlety is relevant. Namely, um, the, the relative information is that what allows you to make prediction about the future. So if you, mean, if you measure spin up, spin up, spin up, spin up, you don't get new information because the, the, the information you have for predicting the future is always the same. So the relevant information is always one bit. But if you measure spin in a different direction, Right, you gain new information. It's always possible to gather new information, but you lose information because you, the information is, is is bounded. You can only have um, have a maximum amount of information, which for a you know one half spin spin one half particles is one one bit. So therefore, these two uh, postulates, you see, they're based on discreteness, on values, and on probabilities to start with. Uh, are the core of, of quantum theory. They're not true in classical theory. Second, uh, uh, the, the second is not true in classical theory. The first is true only in the classical theory when you have a discrete system. Out of this, plus some technical assumptions, uh, you can get Hilbert spaces, operator eigenvalues, eigen systems, and, uh, uh, and all that. I, 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 I skip the, uh, the example. And I want to uh, get to the end um, with the last, uh, key point, uh, which is the connection to the classical world and the notion of stable facts. So relative facts is a value taking, a variable taking a value with respect to another system. Now, if there is decoherence, uh, of course, decoherence uh, erases interference, uh, quantum interference, you don't see it anymore. And what happens is that uh, if you have a third, if you have a system, um, that does not have access to sufficiently large number of degrees of freedom, then um, this system uh, essentially doesn't, doesn't uh, cannot see quantum interference anymore, right? So with respect to whatever this system uh, measures, um, you can reinterpret uh, 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 different branches are, are ignorance of the system, right? As you know very well. And because of that, a small calculation, I'm not gonna go through it exactly, shows that it's irrelevant uh, whether, uh, how you label uh, a, 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 a value. So you can delabel uh, uh, values and you can attribute properties, not relationally to a system with respect to another one, but to the system itself, okay? Once there's enough of the coherence. But of course the coherence is a, it's always approximate and it's relative itself to the fact that um, a system does not have information about, uh, about something else. So the coherence plays the role of uh, connecting this uh, sort of unstable, if you want, world of relative facts where things can be and then stop being uh, to the stability of the, of, of, of the fact. It's a, a, a set of recent papers in which this is um, uh, this is clarified. Um, so quantum mechanics about quantum events, facts, variable taking value between uh, um, uh, system, uh, uh, quantum states are not needed for quantum mechanics. The key equation is xp minus px is ih bar, namely the variables are um, non-commutative. In fact, you can get this equation, this equation from the postulates. 
um, variable stake value punctually, instantaneously at interaction. Careful, interactions is not, uh, in, in this language, it's not long, long in time, right? If you think about a, a, uh, a radioactive atom and, and a Geiger detector, in, in your equation of the interaction between the, 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 the particle, um, the radioactive particle and, and, and the detector is, is going on for a long time. But in reality, the detector clicks at some time. That's what I mean by interaction, the clicking at some time, okay? The emission of a photon by an atom, even if the, uh, the electron of the atom interacts with the electromagnetic field continuously in time. But the, the idea, which is more uh, deep inside, I think, in nature, is that we can describe the nature in terms of a discrete set of things. It's the complete opposite, opposite of the idea that uh, go to the full continuity of the universal wave functions. So variables are relative. Variables have nothing to do with the subjective. Uh, um, facts are uh, rendered stable when there is the coherence. The physical content of quantum mechanics are three. Discreteness, probability, and contextuality uh, in the sense of uh, uh, relationality. So the, um, the main message is that if you want to make sense of quantum theory in this way, which I insist, I don't believe it's the only way, but I think uh, it's a viable way and uh, uh, it might turn out the useful way, uh, then stop thinking of the wave function or the quantum state as the real uh, thing. And, or in other words, listen to Heisenberg and not to uh, Schrodinger. And I'll stop here, um, leaving, I hope, time for um, questions. Yes, thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Then, yeah, we have, uh, we started a bit late. So let's say another eight minutes for questions. And then of course, after that, we have a discussion session. Um, so uh, as usual, I don't know what the chronological order is of the people asking the questions, but I see that David Wallace has his hand raised. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks, Hello, that's very clear. I have a lot of things I could ask. I'll confine myself to one thing for the moment. Um, you're making a reasonable amount of use in the setup of, of, of the idea that I've got um, an understanding of what my systems are and then an epistemic reading of the of, of the wave function of quantum state. <clears throat> but as you know, a lot of the things that in the relativistic quantum mechanics um, are treated as eternal systems are highly state dependent in in more fundamental physics. I, I mean, it's in non relativistic quantum mechanics, I can talk about a neutron as a system. Um, in relativistic field theory, there's a the yeah. neutron creation operator. And if, if, if you ask what are the systems in, in GFT, then the, yeah. the, the only unchanging ones are probably the regions of space. And, and again, as you, as you know better than anyone here, then um, even that kind of level of background stability isn't going to be available in quantum gravity. Yeah. So do you think, we, well, it, it's, it's the challenge, I suppose, like, well, how, how good a grasp do we have um, of what these systems are over which the wave function gives us that very clear question. Complete, completely clear the question yeah yeah i think that the answer is the following um i think we should not confuse uh, quantum mechanics with uh, uh, what we know about the world what are the ingredients of the world uh, like we should not confuse classical mechanics about uh, what are the ingredients of the world um i think classical mechanics is is a general scheme that tell us um uh, if you have a, a piece of, of, of the universe, which can be described in terms of a certain number of variables, then this is a scheme. You have a phase space, you have variables, you have Hamiltonian, you have evolution, you have blah, blah, blah. And quantum mechanics is the same thing. Every time there is a, a, a piece of the world, quantum mechanics doesn't say you which one are the variable, what is the system, what is. Uh, every time there's a piece of the world that admits to be described in terms of variable, quantum mechanics is how to do it. So for instance, and that seems to me um, a good example, take a molecule, right? A molecule in, 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 in chemistry is well described by a number of variables, 10, five, I don't know, four, 10, 20. Uh, of course, we know that the reality is extremely more complicated and we have different levels of, you know, we can, we can, we have atomic theory, we have QCD, we have all this, uh, but that's a different story. That's the physics of which one are the variables, which one are the, um, the Hamiltonian and so on and so forth. And what is remarkable about both classical and quantum theory, and they're the same in that, is that they don't care about uh, that part of the story. 
right? The, 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 a pendulum in classical mechanics is a perfectly coherent uh, uh, conceptually well-defined things. And so is in quantum mechanics, in spite of the fact that there are zillions of atoms also things happening there. So I would say um, every time uh, a piece of the world can be sufficiently isolated uh, to, to be described as a whole by a small number of variables, of course, within an approximation, quantum mechanics applies. And therefore, for instance, uh, uh, I don't know, the, the angular momentum of a molecule is quantized in, in unit of H bar, irrespectively of the fact that there are quarks and so on. You're... The sort of thing I'm worrying about is not so much the, the, the finite grain comp decomposition, it's the indeterminateness of whether the system or not. I mean, I'm imagining a scenario like this. I've got, I've, I've got a couple of particles um, or a couple of atoms, if you like. Um, and I ask, you know, you know I'm, I imagine treating the first one as my system. And it turns out the relative to the first one, um, it's indefinite whether there is a second one or not. Um, it's, you know, uh, it's indefinite whether there's um, actually a molecule or just some free floating particles or even just, just a, some, a, some, some high energy stuff. And then conversely, relative, relative to certain bits of the second system, it's indefinite what I want to call the first system. I mean, that's why I worry that one ends up just being pushed to system to, to get a consistent story. One ends up just being pushed to systems being spatial regions or something. Well, the basic, my basic answer is yes, <laughs> in the sense that um, uh, I mean, as as you know, uh, uh, let's say there are two particles, for instance, a particle which are entangled. We know very well that if you, to the extent in which you look at one particle and you interact with single particle, the, the fact is entangled with the other is, is, is irrelevant. Remember, this is all about states. This is about uh, what you do. Uh, so uh, the tensorial structure of quantum theory, I, I didn't go into that, uh, yeah. but has a, a remarkable property that there is consistency in uh, um, uh, 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 breaking system apart and putting them together uh, to the extent in which when you consider a subsystem uh, on physical ground, you can disregard the interaction with another one. So in other words, quantum mechanics give you probability amplitudes of variable of a system uh, uh, to, to, to evolve in a certain way to the extent in which you know that the system is physically, that it's possible to consider a system isolated. It goes wrong if some interactions happens. So it's a matter of physics when it can be applied. Uh, and, and, and if you think for a moment, it's the same as in classical theory, in, in a sense. It's more complicated because uh, in classical theory, it's just properties of, of the thing by itself. While in quantum theory, it's property of two things interacting, uh, and you can compute the next interaction provided that nothing happens in between. The Okay, I'd love to follow up, but I know there's more people waiting. Sure. I, I, I understand. Then uh, Simon Saunders. So you have your hands raised, please go, please go ahead. Yes, right. thank you, Carlos. That was, that was a lovely talk. Um, and as you know, I too made use of this notion of relative facts and so forth, and was, was drawn to this reading of Everett. But can, can I f frame this purely in classical terms? Um, in, in classical relativistic space-time in particular, we have notions of uh, relations, um, uh, even in Newtonian space-time, that um, spatial relations, obviously uh, temporal relations, the block universe perspective is about a structure with many relational facts, relative facts about what is present relative to what is some future event or some past event and so forth. Simultaneity with respect to one uh, inertial frame uh, and so on and so forth. Now, would you agree with me that just purely in this classical setting, to integrate that collection of relative facts into a unified totality, which is space-time, um, did represent a very significant scientific progress. I mean, if, if you are in agreement with me on that point, I am perplexed in a way as to why you resist the similar integration of all of your relative facts, uh, all of the relative facts or uh, relative states that one can extract from Everett's work the unity of that into the wave function of the universe, into an integrated totality. It seems to me that the two are very much parallel to one another, which is why 
my reading of Everett in terms of relative facts, it was extremely important to push the point and they are integrated into a natural unity in a similar way that Minkowski space-time integrates into a unity, the multiplicity of relative facts concerning tense and so forth. Can you comment on this and how is it that you resist this, this parallel? I mean, one way of resisting it is to deny that the Everett interpretation makes any sense, um, but you're not taking that option. Um, so, so how do you resist this? <laughs> I would very much like to know. Well, um, uh, I would react with two comments. One is that the, the integration uh, can be stronger or weaker. You can add more thing to, to integrate uh, or, or, or less things. And I think one should be careful because, uh, for instance, the relativity of velocity is something we understand very, very well. Uh, and, and one way of understanding is to think that, well, actually there is a space there and things are in actual position somehow. So they do have a velocity by themselves. They do have a position by themselves uh, and we can bring them together. And I think this is a way of integrating which overdoes the job because we're actually adding uh, uh, something which has no physical meaning, I would say as a physicist, namely, the velocity of an object independent of anything else. Uh, truly, the velocity is only defined in, with respect to things. Now, you can take all the relative facts in one, uh, um, one big bunch. Uh, that's one way of viewing um, uh, relational quantum mechanics. It's not the one I prefer, but you can say, OK, let me make a list of all possible facts all, with respect to all possible systems. Um, of course, there's a place to pay, pay because then the non-locality becomes hits you back in, in, in the obvious way. Um, or you can go do much farther and uh, uh, go the many world interpretation, namely uh, 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 take the actual quantum state. Now, from the perspective of relational quantum mechanics, since the state, it's always a relative state So to start with. So it's sort of the coding of what one system, let me put in quotes, knows about the other system. The wave function, the, the global wave function is uh, what an external observer that has never interacted with anything knows about everything. And remember that uh, from the relational quantum mechanics perspective, it doesn't have all the information because uh, uh, you know, the only way to have it have all the information is to go many worlds. So to to imagine that uh, is uh, the, the relativity is not with respect to system, but it's with respect to branches. So you have to have all the branches uh, at the same time. So of course this is possible, all right. Uh, but then the resistance is that uh, for this pleasure of globality, we have added a lot. Do we need it? It's a little bit like hidden variable. Of course, we can get discreteness and, uh, sorry, we can get uh, in, in an easy way determinism with hidden variables. But do we really gain something useful for physics if these are in principle invisible? I mean, it's I mean, not the same story, but it's similar resistance. Again, it's like, I mean, uh, it's like beating on the future, right? Is that perspective going to be useful in the future? I mean, may I say, Carlo, I, I won't continue, um, but uh, just quickly, uh, of course, in the, the case of classical space-time, um, one is thereby committed to all of these events uh, at all times and all places, and that's a great and enormous multiplicity, and one can be critical of, oh, well, so many of these events that are thereby being reified are inaccessible to us, are cut off from us forever, and so on and so forth. So there again are parallel arguments that one can float in the space-time case, but it does seem to me that it is there is overwhelmingly uh, the case that the space-time integration is, is there's an overwhelming case that has been. I know, I know, I know, Simon. I, I fully agree, but uh, there are uh, the four interpretation quantum mechanics I mentioned plus others, and I think each one of those. Uh, uh, have a compelling argument for it. And each one of those uh, requires a cost that, uh, so every person you talk to says, look, look, this perspective is incredibly compelling for this reason, it's true. But, um, 
but is that the right form of discussion? I mean, I think the right form of discussion is, uh, is uh, uh, of course, within we, each one, we can say, well, is there something contradictory missing? And, and, but that's, that's a different story. But uh, which one is the, you gain something for each one, each perspective, and you lose something for, for, for each one. So if we, if each one says, look, how compelling is this perspective? Uh, and how ugly is yours? Uh, that's a that's not a useful uh, way of of of, of uh, uh, going ahead in in the discussion. But I think the discussion is going ahead by by realizing that there are this multiplicity of perspective and uh, and they can be used in different ways. There's no doubt that in in some cases, in some particular, I do want to think. Uh, the different branches is real, right? And in some other cases, I do want to think hidden variables. It's so obvious. I mean, for a single particle, if there was a single relativistic particle, I would be a Bohmian, right? It's a, then Bohm becomes so horrible when there are two particles. Um, so each each perspective has its uh, um, its strong attractiveness and its costs. And uh, that's my answer to you. Is not I, could, I wouldn't say any more than that. Thank that you. point, yes, thanks very much for the question. And I uh, will stop the recording here. Can um, I'd like to invite everyone to thank me, if, uh, to join me in thanking Kyla Rivelli a final time. Thank you.